Hi, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm happy to welcome each of you who joined today's webinar. I hope uh, other participants will join us in a few minutes. Uh, so my name is Lana Viselova. I'm International Partnership Manager of Sibons Group. Uh, for those of you who joined us for the first time, let me give you a brief breakdown. Uh, so apart from being a data vendor, providing you comprehensive data on financial um, fixed income markets, Sibons uh, is also a conference house. Uh, which brings together um, highly experienced experts and uh, institutional and private investors uh, together so we could uh, discuss up-to-date um, market situations. So uh, for those of you who are active in bond markets, I have great news for you. It's uh, this and next week we prepared really curious uh, events. So today's webinar we are arranging with uh, a association with uh, Andreas Bickel, uh, Chief Investment uh, Officer and uh, actually prominent uh, analyst from Blackford Capital. Uh, so currently, as you can see, uh, there is a great anticipation of U.S. elections and actually their results. Um, some uncertainty in terms of uh, the countries which are stepping into the second wave uh, of COVID. Um, so today, uh, Andres will give uh, his own interpretation of the situation and actually possible scenarios. Uh, so today, our uh, event uh, and the theme of our meeting is focused as financial markets before the US election and during the COVID, second COVID wave. We'll cover those topics which we mentioned in our agenda. Uh, after the speech, uh, we'll have some time, so feel free to be active and leave your questions into the question and answer section uh, right below. Um, I'll pick the most interesting uh, questions, so we'll have a uh, very curious discussion afterwards. So I'm thrilled to pass the floor to Andres, uh, which you can see right now. So Andres. Uh, please share your vision to us. Could you please uh, mm -hmm. let me share it because it's blockaded. So now it works. So, welcome from my side and thanks, Alana, for the introduction. Um, when I was asked to prepare this seminar or this webinar, um, the situation was pretty simple. We had a growing economy and we had some more cases of COVID, but the situation seems to be under control. As I speak, um, the situation is completely different. First, uh, we have a dramatic rise in COVID cases. We have today the second uh, sell-off of this week. The first one was on Monday on equities and to a certain degree on corporate bonds. And we have several countries which take measure against COVID. So the two main topics, the two main topics are A, the US election and the impact on GDP development and uh, does it matter for markets? Uh, I will give you at least some hints what history teaches us. Unfortunately, the second topic COVID-19 uh, got a bit bigger than originally planned because uh, Europe is now the hotspot and not any longer the US or uh, India. Therefore, we have definitely to cover some more time on that topic. To start with, um, I think it's important to set the scene why at least some weeks ago, the, the 
outlook would have been pretty good because of the actual implemented stimulus and the planned stimulus. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, um, this might be only secondary due to the other theme which we will be covered. And last but not least, I will give you, as always, some area to invest um, in case you want to put money at work. But let us start uh, first with uh, setting the scene from the monetary and fiscal side. I assume you are all aware of it, but the Fed has decided we will stay low for longer and longer means really, really long, 2024 or even longer. And they have also decided to let inflation overshoot above 2%, with that is a regime change, slash in future, it is not the goal to achieve 2% inflation, it's rather to have on average 2%. And given that the last 12 years, we have never seen 12%, that means uh, market participant expect the Fed to let the inflation figure to go up to 3% and the unemployment rate to drop dramatically before they might start to intervene. Okay. However, interesting, if you read Fed statements, if you follow what Mrs. Lagarde said from the ECB, they both stressed, we need fiscal stimulus. Okay. Why? Because after 12 years of QE1, two, three, QE forever, operational twist, different programs in, in Europe. We have to, to conclude that so far the achievements are minor. A, we have inflated asset prices and B, we have balance sheets of central banks which went up, but C, the purpose of creating growth was partially achieved, but to create inflation was not achieved at all. Okay. Here you see the Fed balance sheet since QE forever, you can see on the chart on the right hand side on the top, was a little improvement or increase of the balance sheet. But so far the Fed holds less than 22% of all outstanding treasuries. Therefore there is in, at least from uh, the angle of the Fed room for uh, improvement or for more buying. While in the ECB not shown is holding roughly 60 plus percent of all outstanding Eurozone government bonds and there the room is limited. What they have achieved is this year at least, that's the yellow line, the real yield of 10 year US treasury is since a while at minus 1%. But there was no growth and there was no inflation. Tips break even inflation rate. So an estimate of future inflation has risen from below 1% to roughly 1.8%. But this is basically an estimate of the market. Even so, um, that's still below 2%. This negative yield in the US on the real term and in Europe, in the UK, so in pounds and in Swiss franc, in nominal and real terms, basically does one thing. It takes away wealth, expropriate, if you will, money from uh, people who buy government bond and puts it to the public sector. That is also known as financial repression, which I have spoken uh, twice already in these uh, webinars in the past. The next question obviously is, can this, this negative real yield in the US go lower? If history is any guide, the answer is straightforward, yes. In the 70s and the 80s, we were at roughly minus four, even a bit lower. Different time, there was the second oil shock and the first oil shock and the nominal rates were extremely high, but real yield were low at that time too. That time uh, was still the ending of the financial repression uh, scenario, but we had growth. And as you know, we had also sinking yields starting roughly from 84 on. The problem is this at the moment. If you take a look at G10, uh, so all G10 central banks, and um, at least for a Swiss fun enough, uh, we are suddenly a G10 country. 
which I would argue for uh, purposes of central banks and importance of currency, that is probably true. Otherwise, in, in purpose of industrial production, uh, we are probably not belonging to the G10 and also not to the G20. What this chart shows you is the change of the aggregated balance sheet of the 10 largest central banks of the world. And if you look at 2008 and ongoing, so Q, QE1, 2, 3, uh, compared to the actual situation, uh, this looks like a, a little joke. This is really, really huge. But as we have just seen, besides as surprise bubbles and uh, negative real yields, there is no inflation. The main target to create growth and to create inflation to inflate the way the debt burden was not achieved. The uh, interesting bit is, I was wondering why, for instance, after 2008, great um, recession, why the US who started actually the problem was coming out the first out of the crisis. And the answer was fiscal stimulus. Why was fiscal stimulus implemented? Uh, the reason for it is Mr. Bernanke called it at that time uh, in the parliament where he had to testify, we have to watch out that we do not fall above the fiscal cliff, thing you hear nowadays as well. That's why nowadays fiscal stimulus is as important as it was in 2008, but uh, for slightly different reasons. Why did he say that? That's the interesting bit of the information, which I learned recently. He has talked to Richard Koh, the American call him Koo, uh, who is the inventor of the theory called balance sheet recession. He wrote in the book at that time that to go out of this recession, we need to have fiscal stimulus. He gave his book to Mr. Bernanke, before his testimony and Bernanke said, thank you. However, I do not have to read it because I agree with your message and I do know your message. The message was we have to put additional stimulus from the fiscal side. Why, however, was never publicly announced by Mr. Bernanke. Why is because people were repairing their balance sheets. So corporate companies, private ones, and individuals who had, for instance, houses, mortgages, and the value of the mortgage was uh, definitely going down and uh, they had to come up with more equity, they were saving, they were not investing. Therefore, you had a lack of investing, low interest rate and a push of money. And this part is never covered in textbook. The textbook doesn't look at the balance sheet recession. How you come out is, with a combination of some at the moment of all available monetary and fiscal measurement. What do we mean by that? <clears throat> it is basically a situation where people save instead of spending, where you put them money in front through monetary stimulus, but the money is not used to invest, it's used to pay down their own debt. And this causes this lack of growth and this lack of infl inflation. This definition was taken out of Wikipedia. Here you see the accompanying chart. Basically, the message is the saving rates and the business investment, there is a surplus uh, of roughly 800 billion in favor of private saving. I thought, wait a minute, uh, where do we stand today? I expected to, that the figure will be higher, but never, really never, I was expecting this. So we start at 800 and look at this. This is in American language, four spot, eight trillion surplus in terms of savers uh, compared to the investments. And that is really, really huge. And it's the key message. If you want to overcome this problem, there's only one way. And the way is called fiscal stimulus in combination with QE, in combination with monetary, modern monetary theory, i.e. debt financing, 
uh, directly uh, from uh, the government to the central banks. And in some cases, nowadays, even excluding the secondary market and financial repression through the bond buying program, you put yields at low levels, you control the yield curve, you take away the investment opportunities from private individual and you nudge them to invest into riskier assets into the real economy. Maybe you think I'm exaggerating. Uh, the Americans are famous for spending money with credit cards. The latest consumer confidence figure from last week uh, was pretty, pretty strong. What the figure didn't show was this. We have the possibility uh, of what you can really have as a credit for, from the credit card. That's the light blue line and what people did this year. And again, you see a huge drop of the credit balance. And that's another hint that the balance sheet recession for in this case, private individual really, really is taking place. And it's not just a theory from a professor. So if I put that together, we have seen so far monetary stimulus. We have seen what I call financial repression. You can call it yield curve control. Um, what it means is basically that the investments in government bond is in nominal and in, more, in almost all cases in real uh, term yielding you negative yield. You transfer wealth from the private sector to the public sector. And we have seen a modern monetary theory. When we were at the Sibon seminar in Hong Kong, somebody from China said that the Chinese central bank at that time, and that's uh, more than one and a half year ago, as uh, that they already at that time issued bonds, which never touched the secondary market, which went directly on the balance sheet of the People's Bank of China. In the meantime, last week, the ECB did exactly the same they issued new bonds for this rescue plan, uh, the fiscal stimulus, which was planned. And more than one third of this issue was not issued at the market. It was gone directly from the issuer to the balance sheet of the ECB. And the Federal Reserve does the same nowadays. So when there is new bond issued and there is not uh, enough demand, it goes directly from one pocket of the government to the other pocket of the government, which is the balance sheet. Um, of the Fed. But what was partially done at the moment, as, uh, as we speak, we're talking of fiscal griff, we are talking of the problem that the parliament doesn't approve the um, stimulus program. Mr. Trump blames uh, Pelosi, uh, the Speaker of the House, of the Democrats, vice versa. But in the end, both sides have agreed we need down the road fiscal stimulus. The key question is in which way? So how much? If, it Biden, if it's Biden, it's more. If it's Trump, it's less. If it's Trump, it goes more to the old economy. If it's Biden, it goes more to new renewable energy and modern sectors. With that, obviously, it is the next question on the table who wins the election? And um, if we know, if we can guess, uh, does it really matter? Putting this question up, the answer is probably <clears throat> it won't, but why? So let's start from scratch. Um, Joe Biden leads uh, the American um, presidential election on a uh, national base of roughly 54 to 46%, full stop, all said. But actually, wait a minute. In two, four years ago, we had exactly the same situation where Hillary was even leading much more than Biden does at the moment. And four years ago, the swing states were a, a, a narrow case. And for the swing state, yesterday, it came out this new poll. On the right hand side, you see the average poll over the last months. The average poll is crystal clear, Biden wins. The latest poll says a different story. First of all, in the national poll, so all voters counted, Trump leads, not by much, but he leads. In the swing states, he has uh, picked up significantly and it is a close race and it really depends who is able 
to um, to put everybody to vote in the last couple of minutes. So mobilization and last time Trump won because of that. So if you look at this, it is definitely open who wins. And um, I would say it's probably 50 plus a tiny bit for Biden, but Trump is really close behind. There are various possible scenario and uh, the question is, does it matter? I mean, first of all, the latest uh, poll for the blue wave so that the Democrats win not just the presidency, but also take the Senate and the House um, has fallen from 58, it was above 60 to 53% and keeps falling. So that is already indicating that it will get a close race. Therefore, what is here written as the Biden and Senate and um, the obvious outcome, at least uh, based on the analysis done uh, by LGT and their asset manager and the polls, I would bet this is not the most likely outcome any longer. It is probably uh, that the Senate and the House will have two different leading parties and it is open if we have Biden or Trump as a president. But if that's the case, it really doesn't matter uh, too much because Biden wants to implement, for instance, an increase in taxes, which will be blocked in uh, the Senate. And Trump wants to implement his other uh, measurements, which will be uh, blockaded in the other uh, parliament. Therefore, um, if it's a blue wave, um, it will be a huge change. I would personally believe that's not going to happen. Uh, if it's a, a divided house uh, plus one of the two presidents, is for me the more likely outcome. It means that in both cases, independent if it's Biden or Trump, the power of the president is limited. If we would ask the market, the equity market, who wins? The answer, at least till yesterday evening, were still crystal clear. If you have a positive three month rolling return before the election, out of the last 23 election, the running president, and the answer was yes, the running president was winning. Yesterday, we were roughly at 5%. Today, as we sell off, we are now still slightly in the green, maybe two and a half percent but it's getting closer and closer to zero. But so far, the market would bet on Trump. Does it matter? Well, on one hand, Trump, we know what he does or would do. Um, he doesn't really have a program, so he will continue with his uh, actual policy. He will try to lower taxes. He will do certain fiscal stimulus, but much less than, um, than the Democrats want. And that's one of the key points why the fifth uh, stimulus package is still in, in, pending in the Senate. He will continue to try to end Obamacare with, as he has the majority in the Supreme Court with the latest announcement of the new judge. Uh, he has a majority and it's possible that uh, he will continue to diminish uh, the effect and uh, the power of the Obamacare. And last but not least, he will definitely not invest into clean energy. He will support old energy, be it the oil energy, be it fracking, be it core industry. On the other hand, if Biden were to win, um, he would cautiously reopen um, uh, the diplomatic channels um, towards, um, uh, towards China and towards Europe. However, he has said that, that he continues um, with his way of America first. And to open a bracket, President Xi said in the Congress two days ago where they discuss the next five-year economic plan that he's planning a very similar thing, his version of China first. So less export, more internal uh, consumption, more internal uh, production and services and less interaction with the global world. 
Uh, Biden would, however, invest into green uh, project, into renewable energy in healthcare. Uh, estimates uh, tell us that it would be around 5 billion. That's a huge amount. Trump is willing to spend maybe 1.5 to 2 trillion. Uh, both, by the way, is substantially higher than QE1 or QE2 or QE3. So the stimulus package from the fiscal side will be huge. Nevertheless, Biden has also said he will increase corporate taxes from 21 to 28%. That costs roughly 4% of GDP. And he will increase the minimum wage, which will also cost a certain amount of growth. Estimates are around 1%. So the stimulus package uh, together with these two latest measurement are plus minus uh, getting zero. Therefore, uh, markets are, are starting to, to price in that and start to live with it. Uh, there will be winners, obviously. Uh, the pricing in of that has already started. If you look as, as an example to the new energy index, you could see that it is up roughly uh, 85 percent after the correction before we were even up more than 100 percent year to date the whole sector uh, is really in partially beating the fang stocks which is amazing although it's not really making to the headline does it matter was the question well if we have the purple line, which means that we have an election with an uncertain outcome with some low cases and uh, some disturbance and we don't know who will rule in January, uh, that's the weakest scenario. And we see that the growth uh, would probably go down for one or two quarters before picking up. If we were to have um, um, the blue wave, that's uh, coincidence, the blue line, the top line, you can see that has the strongest impact and there wouldn't be any any drop in, in expected GDP. If the actual situation continues, you can see that uh, the orange line is below the blue, but is still the second best. And if the Biden were to win and the Congress is divided like it is now, uh, there is still growth, but less than when Trump is in charge. And now it comes the big, however, this measurement is probably not taking fully into consideration possible lockdowns. And with that, unfortunately, we come soon to the next step. Uh, I, have to, I have to add something more important first. I said, does it matter? The answer is from a stock market, no. If you look at this, you see uh, total performance of the S&P since 1932. Blue um, are um, the Democrats and red or orange is Trump and his party. And if you look at this, actually roughly 15% when the Democrats uh, have the president and roughly 10% when the Republicans have the president. This is maybe a bit unfair because you have the dot-com bubble and you have the Watergate of where um, if we take this out, then the result is equal. So both presidencies um, have produced historically very similar return, stock market return in the US. How does it go on until uh, the election? I mean, today we have a sell-off and one week before, so next week starting, um, on average, markets tend to go up. If that's this case, uh, this time the case is definitely open. Markets today are quite panicking on the second wave globally and on the third wave and, uh, in the US of COVID cases. Um, it has to be seen. What midterm will happen is probably this. Um, most likely once we know who is the president and once the fiscal package is announced, um, we are going to see an upwards move in US equity. But before that, even shown in this chart, although this chart is already some days old, before this election day, you should expect certain turbulences and sell-offs where we are in right now for reasons which are COVID 
and the spread of the virus globally. This is a global map. Uh, the brighter the color, the more cases. So you see that uh, the big block, the US, Brazil, to a certain degree, India, Russia, and Europe are brighter than other areas. And that means also there, the spreading of the virus is compared to the other countries um, accelerating or much higher. Really uh, from today is this chart. Um, I have just added it for one reason. As we speak, Mrs. Merkel and um, all presidents of the Bundesländer are meeting up to discuss a partial lockdown. Here the same, uh, the brighter the color, the less cases. And as you can see, uh, Germany is one of the brightest spot on the map and they are discussing um, curfew, so close down, partial close down of the economy. In Czechoslovakia and um, mm -hmm. in Belgium, they have already locked down. We can argue makes sense. If you look at the color, that means a lot of cases. Also France, uh, Spain and Italy do have partial lockdowns and curfews in the night. Uh, but if you just look at the color and the number of cases, uh, we can argue. But nevertheless, that are facts. This is more uh, putting it to the point. You see black line is the US and uh, Spain, orange leading, followed by France and uh, by the UK. Um, these are the number of cases per 10,000 inhabitants. Uh, if there were Switzerland on the map, we would be leading the pack. As we speak, the press conference was just um, finished and uh, we are not implementing in Switzerland uh, lockdowns or curfews. Um, we are trying to go a middle way, although based on statistics, we are definitely leading the pack. The, the WHO has on Monday announced that the current wave will not be brought under control at least for a month. So until December, they expect this getting worse and not better. Even though all these countries shown here um, have implemented already severe measurements. What is striking is this table. On one hand, one key message is Japan, China, and Korea. So three different Asian countries with different regimes, they have it under control. Uh, different India, uh, India never put measures in place. Um, but even there, in absolute turn, it's huge. If you look at the total cases, uh, Yes, it is definitely severe, but it is less than two and a half percent of mortality of the cases and the number of cases in terms of the total population is not that big. Amazing is the US, they lead the pack, but they lead the pack in various ways. They lead the pack uh, here because of the absolute cases in terms of deaths, deaths per one million inhabitants, but they also are one of the country in the world who is continuing to grow, where consumer confidence is strong, where the job market is uh, improving from a low level, but still improving, where QE GDP is expected to be up 30%. This is the way the American measure it. So you expect to be year over year, seven and a half, but they analyze it and then you get to 30% and they were minus 35 in Q2. And it's expected that Q4 will already be uh, plus 2%, including the COVID cases. If that were to happen, so the US is already or would already be out of the recession. Today, the news or the headline, which was stroking, uh, but from a Western point, uh, it's a bit to smile. China, you see here, new cases total 20. New cases today, they have doubled. They have now 40 new cases. Wow. But 
China is immediately implementing measurements and 40 cases to one spot for four uh, billion of habitants. Um, I think we can agree uh, that the problem is not in China. However, I would like to repeat what I said at the beginning. China this year did two things to come out. Three things actually. One was um, they controlled everything. They closed down the, uh, the region of Wuhan. This is from the virus angle. But from the monetary, they did monetary stimulus, but to be followed, accompanied by a substantial amount of fiscal stimulus. And the latest GDP figure in China show 4.9% plus and in September an acceleration of growth in the service area, in the leisure area, in consumption. Then if I look at this figure in the end, what is left? Why we have this problem? Why we have these curfews? Why we have these lockdowns? And the answer is because the healthcare system has broken down in Belgium, in Czech, is at the edge in Germany, although they have not too many cases is at the edge to break down in Spain, in France, in the UK and Italy, which we have seen on the other chart, they are leading the pack in Europe. And that's really the problem because if the hospital is not able to deal any longer with um, the new COVID cases, they start to postpone um, operations for normal cases. Uh, which is already starting in some cases, um, and this is severe. And that's the real problem, not the number of deaths. I mean, we are talking of one spot, one seven million people who died. That is extremely unfortunate. Uh, but put this in relation to the total world population or take the 44 million rounded, it's less, 44 million rounded cases globally to the number of people living. So it is not that much, but our system, healthcare system cannot handle it. And that's the problem. And how can you stop it? Japan, China, and Korea shows pretty easy and pretty strong. You have to have distance, you have to minimize contact. And if you have contact, you have to protect yourself. Simple, straightforward. But a lot of country um, and especially we as citizens are tired of this measurement. And that's why the second wave came. It came much faster, much stronger than we all expected. And here you see another point to, to, make, to, to support this, uh, this argument. The orange line shows you the new cases inverted, and the blue line shows you the Google Activity Index. All governments I know have asked us to come down, to stop activity, to do home office, to go less out, etc., etc. While in spring, March, May, you see the blue line, people followed, cases came down, now it's basically flat and the cases explode. And that's the reason why at the moment, all measurement you put in place are not really uh, showing effect. By the contrary, uh, the, the time it takes to double the cases is roughly one week in all countries. And it's a simple math if you double every week, it is a question of some few weeks until you have too many cases for your healthcare system. I was talking of the third wave in the US. Um, this is here basically the light blue line. You see the first wave, then there was never really a, a, a breakdown of that wave. It came immediately a second wave, a, a certain breakdown over summer, but it was still a new confirmed cases every day uh, were at high levels. And now, as we speak, we have a new record high. That is huge. But at the same time, I said it before, statistics show us this. This on top is the initial jobless claim, still uh, below 800,000, but roughly 100,000 less uh, people who ask for help. Uh, from the insurance for, for unemployment and also the continuous claim have dropped more than a million. They are still 
8.4 million looking for a job, but they are no longer 25 million we have seen in May. And that keeps dropping, although the COVID cases go up. And maybe that's the new normal. Maybe we have to live in the future with the fact that um, the masks will have to be put on and uh, we have to have certain distance and we have to live that we see daily new cases. The mortality rate has come down substantially. So uh, uh, the healthcare system has learned to a certain degree how to deal with it. The only thing which is unfortunately not playing according to what politicians tell us is the vaccine. Yesterday, the CEO of Novartis said, well, the vaccine, it might be available in, let's say, six to nine months time. And then it takes another three to six months until we can produce enough globally uh, of the vaccine. If you add these figures up, that basically means by the end of next year, so by the end of 2021, we might finally start to have a real cure for this disease. Therefore, till everybody is, um, is uh, getting their vaccine uh, and um, the number gets close to zero, it will get 2022. And that's a shocking new news, which is partially priced in today, although the market is more concentrating on the new cases uh, and not on the statement of Novartis, which was made yesterday. As you probably know, the US market yesterday was flat. Amazing is also this, it is obviously showing Q3 earnings, but in America, more than 80% of large cap and almost 90% of small caps are beating analysts estimate. Does it matter? Well, if you beat, you are hardly up. That's on the left hand side is zero spot one. So the white bar is pretty low. However, if you miss, you are hammered and today, some companies have missed and uh, given that the market is down, guess what happened with that companies? They are down much more. So at the moment, the situation or the, the earning season doesn't really matter. Um, it is also to a certain degree distorted because bottom up analysts are normally behind the curve in a recovery, but we are talking of Q3. Q4 is now, and at the moment we see slowdowns. This in particular in Europe, on the top you see for almost all regions an activity uh, index tracker from Goldman Sachs. And till the middle of October, you can already see that we have slightly dropped. Uh, that means that the service sector that you can see underneath service sector is below the growth area. And that's obvious because if you have to close your restaurant at six in the evening, like for instance in Italy, if you have to close your uh, the disco or nightclub uh, totally, uh, if you cannot go to the cinema, to, to theaters, you name it, all service, um, by definition you start shrinking. Amazing, however, is that the manufacturing sector keeps on growing and in some areas has even added. In Germany, we are at 58, 58 uh, is above the 55 threshold. So this is an acceleration of an already strong growth. This is amazing. Why so? Well, Germany uh, exports to China and to Asia where the growth is pretty good. They also export to America where the growth is decent to good. And only within Europe, we have uh, growth problems. But in the end, bottom line, we don't know how severe the COVID impact will be, but it has definitely a severe impact on Europe, a certain impact on, on the US, as we have seen, um, the, the US is growing below potential, but it's definitely growing at a nice pace during Q3 and most likely Q4 but Europe is starting to come back into a slowdown and maybe even a double deep recession or as, as most people put it nowadays with letters, a W recovery. So we are in the second V of the W, if you will. You can also see this on these two slides. 
EPS estimate on the right hand side for Europe, and you can also see it on um, the activity for uh, Europe on the um, left hand side. They are back to levels pre crisis, but the expected EPS earnings uh, per share for European companies is definitely shrinking more than 20%. However, if it goes as I've uh, painted the picture and American is modeling through and uh, the wave stays at levels we are at the moment and they are not further really locked down everything. On a national level, Trump has gave in. So basically they decided we just let it develop while on individual states, we can see that measures are put in place, but there is no national campaign any longer to fight against COVID. Uh, therefore, the likelihood that in Q1, we see a similar growth like now in the US is pretty high. This together with the expected fiscal package of one of the two uh, uh, parties with uh, different shades and grays, if you will, this will definitely push equity markets higher. Future will tell, uh, but that's the main assessment to that. There's also another reason why, um, why I believe this rally is not over, that we are in a, what uh, Credit Ag, Julius Baer called today, a bull market correction. We see that there is a huge amount of money parked in money market product. And although this line is falling, so some money was put to work, it went partially into government bonds and corporate bonds, but it didn't go to equities, that's the line at the bottom. It went obviously to real estate, it went to consumer goods, it went to cars, it went to art, partially to gold, but definitely not to equity. And there is still a lot of money parked on the sideline. And as you have seen at the beginning, real yields in the US and nominal and real yields in Europe, in Japan, in the UK, they are uh, all nudging you to invest your money. If not, you pay storage costs, you pay negative interest rate. Um, this is all deliberately done. With that, I come um, to the conclusion. If you have followed uh, my presentation before, you probably are not too much surprised. I keep saying since some week um, that LATAM is a, a risk trade, but uh, yeah, I would consider it and uh, Asian is a place to be and don't underestimate Europe and especially don't invest into Europe. Here you see this uh, one month rolling uh, total return from yesterday. The best area was Russell 2000. So there was a sector rotation because Nasdaq is only number four on the list. The second best was Asia and the third is already Brazil. And excluding today in with European equities, you would have done basically nothing, including today you are roughly down 3%. Um, I, 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 I show this more for illustration purpose and I, 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 I would like to stress the period is too short and it uh, such a short period has to do with luck, but midterm I would uh, expect uh, that this pattern in a certain degree repeats. Therefore, the key message is assets are protected in the best way in the US, the second best way probably in, in Europe. And then uh, I would rather bet on Japanese uh, uh, bank than on the UK because of the Brexit, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's the equity side. Interesting is the, the corporate sector. The corporate sector have seen uh, spread tightenings, very good performance of the double B area, also of the lower investment grade area. However, on Monday, we have lost 1% in US high yield. We have gained back something yesterday. And today, I expect that we will lose a similar amount like on Monday, which gives us probably good uh, entrance uh, in uh, corporate. Uh, in dollars from the US. Asian or emerging market uh, corporates 
are attractive on a selective basis. Uh, we produce regularly uh, bond recommendations. Most of them are in the area of uh, China, but there are other areas. There are also some interesting Russian corporates, um, uh, which we uh, produce uh, regularly. So if you're interested, uh, get in uh, contact with us. We believe as well that gold uh, is in a consolidation phase. Uh, gold suffered from a rising dollar and from rising treasury yields, but it didn't sell down. It stayed at the level of roughly $1,900 an ounce. Having said all this, uh, there are a lot of risks uh, around. Um, they haven't changed much, actually. So all assets are expensive. Bonds are more expensive than equity, but both asset class are um, definitely expensive, given that I expect uh, more stimulus in the US, given that the um, European stimulus is bigger than what the American have so far announced. Uh, I guess that we have a, a, a good cushion and um, that there is a certain downside protection. The American call it a uh, talk of Visco Cliff. Um, that's the fifth package, which is pending. But as we speak yesterday and the day before, both candidates, US presidential candidates have announced after the election, if I were to win, the package will be huge, it will be great. That was Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden uh, said it in his word, but it will be bigger and it will be also in the green energy. Therefore, the risk are midterm, not as we speak today, but midterm rather for a melt up than than uh, a global crash. As we speak, I have a supporting chart, which is really uh, out of, of printing, came really five minutes before this uh, webinar started. Uh, you see underneath the S&P, the S&P trades below its 50-day average is approaching its 90-day uh, average. They call it, Julius Baer call it, and I fully agree with, with it, they call it a bull market consolidation. While in Europe, we have broken out of this uh, sideways channel, uh, which was in place over the whole summer, and we have broken down uh, the 200 day average. So in Europe, I would be at the moment very careful to enter. You see also a gap there in the chart of the ducks, maybe down the road after the sell-off, uh, you, you you might make uh, a bet on it. But at the moment, if you look it from a technical angle, if you look it from the COVID angle, if you look it from the uh, lockdown angle, the curfew angle, uh, Europe is definitely a, a difficult place to invest. And, um, and uh, I would rather uh, put it on the side if, if I have the, the freedom um, to do so. With that, I have finished the official part mm -hmm. and uh, let's open it up for question. I do have as well supporting chart, depending on what kind of question we can uh, have a look um, at, the, at them too. Thanks a lot for listening. Andres, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, actually, we do have a few questions, so I would um, rather want to check um, just a second. Uh, so, for instance, what are your thoughts on the future of exploration uh, of funds from private sector to uh, government sector um, because of uh, the negative real yields? Uh, will it continue once uh, the economic growth and inflation starts? That really depends on your private situation. So if you were to get um, subsidized unemployment help um, from the state you live in, you're probably not really hardly hit. And if you continue to work, neither. So these lucky people obviously uh, won't have really um, to save down the road, but there are a lot who don't profit from this kind of support and the support is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And to quote Mr. Ku, although I call him rather Ko, I don't speak Japanese, but I think it's Ko. Nevertheless, he said 
and I fully believe uh, and agree with him that all those people who have now de um, desaved, so must uh, survive with their savings once this um, pandemic is over and the economy starts growing, they will not repair their balance sheet uh, because this was done in most cases before, but they will save money and be afraid of future events like a pandemic and they will probably not go back um, to the market and they probably will not invest at all. What he didn't answer and what is at the tricky bit of this answer is how much or in percentage this is. Um, it is but probably the majority in most countries because if I look at the, what you get in the UK for help, um, if you're unemployed or if you have to stay at home and cannot do home office, it's so limited that uh, this uh, will be a large percentage. And then uh, it has the same effect like the balance sheet recession. And to come out, you need two things. You need in the beginning monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus, but the intonation is on fiscal stimulus. Mm -hmm. I actually have my personal question. <laughs> Please uh, take me uh, yeah, so I could take advantage of it. So your previous webinar was on uh, WV shape recovery rate. So uh, it is more related to already to speak about second and third wave. Uh, so which uh, economies do you consider actually less affected uh, by all these uh, lockdowns and uh, coronavirus, like your top three? Well, top three is hard. Uh, I know. <laughs> one is crystal clear. Number one is, is China, because they yeah. forced about 9% acceleration in September. Number two is really, really, really tricky. Um, because the US has a very strong Q3 and a very uncertain Q4, while South Korea, Japan, and other Asian uh, countries, excluding India, showing pretty good uh, growth. But um, given the size and the importance and the stimulus and the expected stimulus, I would still put number two, the US, uh, with a bit of a headache. Uh, and But if I were to be true, if we have 60% of global GDP, which is growing, uh, and in Q3, I would argue we had a V-shaped recovery, which is now completely distorted. Um, it will be V-shaped in China. It will be a blurb, if you will, in the US. And in Europe, I fear we will rather have a W. Uh, because the cases are increasing, people in Italy, for instance, they do riots, they don't want the lockdown, they don't want curfew. I do understand that personally, but um, in the end, it's, it's about uh, growth, and this will definitely uh, cost a lot of growth. Um, it is also important that we see this fiscal stimulus, and for the first time, I must say something positive about the IMF. The IMF said recently, Although Italy has a debt to GDP ratio above 150% and keeps rising dramat dramatically, they didn't say you have to do saving and austerity. For the first time in history, at least to my knowledge, they said for the time being, you must support the economy and you must spend. I wonder if they knew about the balance sheet recession or not. I know that Mr. Benenke knows about it and he implemented it. Um, I, to my humble knowledge, I have no clue why the IMF said that, but it's at least remarkable. And down the road, uh, I, I must add, down the road there are positives. We have um, similar to the 20s, so rowing 20s, ages ago, we have a change in economy to digitalization, internet of things, um, clean energy in, 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 a, in, a, in a broader sense, um, digitalization already said, there will be a lot of winners, uh, not just the FANG stocks, more around. Uh, and we have this massive stimulus from both sides and Etia Deni, uh, from Adeni Research, used to be a Deutsche Bank, a very well-known US strategy. He used the terms, are the rowing 20s back? His answer is straightforward, yes. Um, 
I uh, am a bit more modest. I believe we will go into a, a, a melt up uh, down the road and, and down the road is probably 2024 or so because so long uh, the Fed has announced to keep rates at zero and rates at zero means uh, negative real yields in the US and obviously means uh, for the euros, for pounds, for Swiss franc, for yen, uh, negative nominal and real yield. But this will end up in a melt up. But I said that before, and uh, so far I get always pushbacks, and as long as I get pushbacks, um, I believe it's possible, knowing that it's at the moment, especially today, when we see a sell-off, a brave statement. I wonder who will win the contest. I believe uh, later on we'll speak about another great seven or what <laughs> great nine which we have right now. All right, we uh, have a question. Uh, why uh, has private um, savings ballooned when yields are historically low and why there is a limited demand from uh, government bonds, uh, like 30% uh, being purchased by other government buyers? So where are all the savings going? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, it is amazing that you have yields, which basically are zero, you lose money, and people save and you have no inflation. That are facts about this, probably we cannot uh, really argue. Now, the reason, if you believe Mr. Ko, and uh, I do because it fits my picture, but uh, be free to disagree. Um, people are still suffering from the great financial uh, recession we have seen in particular in the US. And although most of them have most likely repaired their balance sheet and uh, paid back uh, the, the mortgage, which was too high compared to the value of the houses, we see in the US uh, also, at least in the higher end of the market, um, I wouldn't call it a bubble, but investments in that area. So people rather buy uh, homes than government bonds and they still hoard cash. And Mr. Ko again, I'm sorry to keep quote him again, but uh, um, maybe it gives a bit more value. He believes that all these people are so scared of markets, financial assets, and obviously mortgage, that they probably will never in their lifetime come back to financial markets. That's why uh, money flow out of equity is so pronounced. Um, the government bond buying is mostly institutional driven. So if you are an insurer and a pension fund scheme, you are forced to buy them, knowing that you won't get any return at all, but you are really forced to. Uh, I'm not aware of private individual who, who buy that, um, but uh, the main point is uh, people really save now for different reasons than 10 years ago, but they're really safe. And the COVID situation is pushing them if they can even to save more. So the helicopter money in the US was either put in the stock market or was put aside, but it was definitely not used to invest. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is another question in which assets we should better invest. Uh, we have two questions more or less related to gold. So um, what is your take on gold miners? Do you consider them a good way to uh, get access to gold? And uh, well, I believe we can take it uh, additionally to this. Sorry. Probably sharing the screen <laughs> right now. Um, and uh, is it a good time to invest in gold or wait uh, uh, after the US election and even beyond? So you can see supporting slide. I, I was expecting this question. Um, maybe I was not crystal clear, but you can hate gold or you can love it. I'm neutral in this term, but I believe that midterm money will flow into safe assets. And one of them is gold. Mm -hmm. Now, bears will tell us, well, gold is expensive. Uh, you cannot measure it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But put it around. Um, you see sideways channels since two, three months. Uh, but at the same time, not shown here, but uh, we have seen higher dollar and we have seen higher treasury yield and gold didn't sell down. 
So I am uh, in the camp of gold will pass the 2000 level again. And the question was gold miner. And the answer is we bought gold uh, during summer, gold miner, sorry. Um, therefore I'm biased, but um, I'm a rather positive on gold. I, um, as I'm in the supporting area, let me also show you this chart. Um, this is Dr. Copper. Um, you see that during the last four months, copper is slightly up. And since the sell-off in March, it's significantly up. Although economists, and now I'm bashing IMF, sorry for that, but IMF and the World Bank told us how bad the year will be, et cetera, et cetera. But Dr. Copper, which is more, at least used to be a very good indicator for uh, forward-looking uh, GDP and industrial production, um, tells us another story. And therefore, um, there's also growth around. And with that, uh, I would also uh, continue with investing into Asian equities, US equity, and with uh, a bit of a headache, Brazilian. But I would at the moment, unless we see a, a further sell-off, no touch um, European equities. And um, if I may, I, I also add, um, we kept the whole time being invested into um, hard currency bonds. We don't do local currency. Local currency should profit from the, from the weaker expected dollar, which actually I have here. You see, we had um, the dollar in uh, August finding a, a low. We had a certain updrift but uh, since the beginning of October, we see on average um, the dollar going down and that is supportive for local currencies. So if you are an expert in local currency bonds, definitely a place to consider. We are not, we buy hard currency bonds and we believe that with this uh, spread widening today on, on Monday, the situation uh, got really more attractive than it was already. Andreas, yeah, I actually uh, really close to my next question. So talking about the currencies, um, some people say that um, uh, U.S. Uh, dollar is not that hard currency right now. Do you consider maybe some additional currencies like Euro or G GBP um, kind of like stronger right now and better for saving for uh, investments? Well, now it comes uh, the problem from the Western guy uh, trying to, uh, to give an answer, uh, knowing that you think most likely a bit different than, than I do, because you don't care if it's dollars, if it's uh, euros, whatever. And I would say it depends if you think in dollars or in euros. Knowing that this is not what you want to hear, so let, let, let me try to, to answer your question. Um, I would agree with your um, statement, if you will, uh, that the dollar is not the hard currency, that it will weaken. And if you are agnostic of currencies, uh, so you don't care if it's euros or others, uh, although the euro is a misconstruction, but most likely it will stay stable. The Swiss franc is overvalued, but is a strong currency. Uh, the Japanese yen didn't profit from this recent sell-off, is normally a strong currency. And the pound, it depends. I mean, every day we hear <coughs> Brexit, we stop it, we stop it, and they keep on talking and talking and talking because both sides know that the costs of a real breakup is or are or would be too high. But until that is clear, most likely the pound will stay weak. Once we have a solution, um, it's really speculative. But assuming that they find a deal, probably that is a snap back trade. But then again, you think pounds ruble or pounds dollar? Pounds ruble, I'm sorry, I cannot answer. <laughs> if you think uh, against dollar, probably it's worth a trade. I hope that uh, answers a bit your question, knowing uh, that uh, I couldn't answer the way I would normally answer. 
No worries. Well, we'll speak about this a bit later, actually. Uh, probably next week will be a more practical thing. And uh, I believe we'll make another webinar with you when uh, the picture will be a bit more clear on the event investments. Um, all right, well, probably let's uh, take uh, the last question. Uh, so, uh, how would you structure a currency basket for global investors without um, home currency preference? It is more or less related to, <laughs> to this. Uh, <clears throat> well, if I have, and now I, I, I stick to that, but if I have a dollar portfolio, I would put a lot of money uh, into Asian uh, hard currency bonds and China A shares and Vietnam shares. They are normally traded in dollar, although you don't buy dollars. And uh, probably the Chinese in Minbi is going to strengthen. Vietnam fights against it, but given their success, uh, uh, given the, the, the strong economy, given the move to deglobalization and made in China is not exportable, so it's made in Vietnam by Chinese companies. Um, don't ask me what's the difference, but legally I know what's the difference. Um, so these are two areas. I would definitely not bet against the Fed or Uncle Sam. Um, it's not that I'm a fan um, or in particular of, of, let's say, that area. But um, what was the best equity market over the last uh, 12 years? The answer is unfortunately straightforward. <laughs> um, what is the, and I changed slightly the intonation, what is the least risky uh, equity market over the coming 24 months, and I repeat, risky, uh, is the US. Um, I believe you will make money there, but probably you make more money in emerging markets. Um, once the British thing is settled, you might take a risk trade. I personally uh, say since roughly four to six weeks in Brazilian equities, the, I mean, the COVID situation is worse, but it got slightly better from a very bad uh, situation. The PMI data forward looking uh, estimates of, um, of, of, of GDP and industrial production are surprisingly strong. Uh, that could be an angle. The currency is definitely undervalued, by the way, uh, but it's extremely volatile. Um, I personally, uh, since really a long time, and uh, today I feel really good about it, there are other times, but on average, um, I would be extremely cautious with Eurozone equities, because I see structural problem. I see finally from the ECB and from the political side stimulus, which is um, amazing, and uh, we really have to, to, uh, to take them credit for that. But bottom line, um, I mean, you can selectively single stocks. I mean, there are great Italian companies which happen to have the headquarter, as an example, in Italy, uh, but not their economic risk in Italy. Or, or as a Swiss, obviously, you know, uh, the, the largest consumer company in the world is based in Switzerland, but the revenue is 3%. Therefore, if you buy um, the largest Swiss stock, uh, you buy basically 97% of global income stream and not a Swiss stock. But on, on, on average, I would be very careful um, about the European area because there is a lot, of, a lot of structural reforms missing. We still don't have a fiscal union in the Eurozone. We have the Brexit not solved, et cetera, et cetera. True. Um, all right. I don't see other questions. Come on. What question to oil. I'm disappointed. <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, if you have some more comments, feel free. I believe uh, we can uh, finalize our discussion uh, here. So if I don't see uh, other questions. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much for very interesting discussion. I really like when uh, it is possible to speak directly, not only uh, to hear the theoretical points, but also to have very good discussion uh, on some crucial questions which are just rolling in your head for last weeks. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, if I may say so, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I included today a more theoretical part. Uh, obviously, if you talk five minutes about balance sheet recession, you cannot really explain it from the heart. But um, you find it on YouTube, and if you were to believe in it, um, and you see the four um, the four aspects I, I showed, if they are um, visible and will be implemented, the COVID impact on growth is not that severe like uh, the news headline we see now daily. Well, we still have one more question. Uh, well, actually, yeah, we uh, um, covered gold, we covered different assets, but what do you think about oil uh, price moving forward? And actually, it is very um, curious situation, especially for stocks, uh, which are also oil related, some companies. <laughs> I'm personally interested again. <laughs> Ah, uh, I wish I, I had a crystal ball, but um, okay, let me uh, uh, here. This is the WTI future as of yesterday. And as you can see, it has broken all resistance. So 200 day moving average, 100 day and 50 day average. And uh, the problem here is basically um, there is too much supply, too much production. And uh, the demand um, is low. The demand unfortunately stays lower for longer because uh, traveling is not going to happen anytime soon. So the airline industry is almost at the bottom. The production cost uh, was uh, postponed again. So the, uh, there is definitely a mismatch from production uh, um, or demand and supply. Um, the oil futures were contango. So if you were to invest and, and the price were to go up, you still lose on rolling. So it's really tricky. And last but not least, uh, you ask about the stocks. And the stocks, um, it really depends who wins. If Biden wins, fracking is not forbidden. So there will be still fracking. However, um, he will put roughly three trillion into new renewable accessible energy. The European Union pushes into the same direction. So there is a structural shift away from the traditional oil companies. And most of them have already cut uh, the dividend stream. Therefore, you will still get on an actual price a decent dividend. But in a longer term, um, it is really hard to see higher, higher oil, uh, oil stock prices of the stocks uh, unless they, they build up uh, the renewable part, some try. But you have a lot of uh, companies who are leading in that sector. And I, I said that before the, um, the index the, um, and the renewable energy index year to date, uh, only stocks is up roughly 85% year to date. And um, there are companies I have never heard before, besides maybe the, um, the hydro, hydro, hydrogen stocks, uh, but all the others were completely unknown to me. And most of them even are not producing profits. Um, but bottom line, um, I would be careful. Although I'm invested in, in the Russian index, uh, so I'm, I, I'm a bit contradicting myself, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> Pleased to hear. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we will actually discuss uh, where is high yield next week. Uh, so uh, we'll see, we'll discuss uh, more details a bit later. Uh, right, then let's... Um, um, close our uh, discussion for today. I'm very uh, thankful and really thrilled that you were able to make it uh, so we could arrange uh, such amazing discussion today. Uh, and for those of you who will be able to participate uh, next week, join us and see uh, our next event. All right, thank you very much. Then I'm leaving. Oh, thank you. Thank you.